In Fairfax County, Virginia, police find a decomposed body, but have no report of a crime. In Fort Myers, Florida, a killer confesses to a grisly crime, but the police cannot find a body. A serial killer may go free unless police find the evidence to put him behind bars. In each case, forensic scientists must find proof of the crime in the bones of the murder victim. Using scientific studies of human decay to find out when the victim died so the killer may be traced. Hoping to prove there is no perfect crime. That dead men do talk. December 1993. In a wooded area near Washington, D.C., a surveyor has made a gruesome discovery. While mapping out a new suburb in the Virginia countryside, he has stumbled on a body buried in a shallow grave. Officers from the Fairfax County Police Department arrive at the secluded area where the body had been found. The first homicide detective on the scene is Detective Jerry Farrell. How you doing, Officer Gregory? What do you got? There's a human skull right over here. Okay. Take a look. The police assume it's a homicide. But there are no immediate clues to help identify the victim. And Lieutenant Wilson, he's there. You want to take a look? What you're going to need is uh, start mapping out the area. Secure this area here, and then we're going to need at least 50-foot area perimeter set up around this one. Yes, sir. The team of investigators will search a wide area. Scavengers have dragged parts of the body away. The police meticulously document the position of the body with photographs, sketches, and notes. Detective Dennis Wilson heads the cold case squad, investigating crimes where the trail of evidence has gone cold. In such cases, every clue, every piece of evidence, no matter how small, may be the key to solving the crime. in the murders of a couple of prostitutes in an adjoining county. He's been how many core samples do you From think you're going From bits of clothing and hair, detectives Wilson and Farrell are fairly sure the victim is a woman. Since decomposition often leaves fatty residues, the officers take soil samples near the body. Chemical analysis could help determine when the victim was buried. Well, you only have one chance at a crime scene, and you have to do it right the first time. So you slow things down at that point. There's no hurry. The body's obviously been there for some time. Uh, we're going to try to gather all the evidence we can and make sure we don't miss anything. There just may be one small little clue here that's going to lead to either her identity or the identity of the perpetrator. Because the body is so badly decomposed, the detectives make a call to nearby Washington, D.C. Dr. Douglas Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution is an anthropologist whose specialty is identifying human remains from soldiers who died in the Civil War to the modern-day victims of homicide. 
He has testified in many criminal trials as a forensic scientist. Forensic meaning science used as proof in a court of law. Receiving the call from the Fairfax County Police, he agrees to visit the site where the skeleton has been found. In the usual case, murder victims are assigned to medical examiners who dissect the body to find the cause of death. But medical examiners are accustomed to dealing with fresh bodies. Here, only bones are left to tell the tale, requiring the special skills of the anthropologist. It takes three days of careful excavation to take the body from the ground. Back in his laboratory, Owsley hunts for signs of the victim's age, sex, and the manner of death. It is immediately apparent that the victim is female. The pelvic bone is wider in females to accommodate childbirth. Though Owsley believes the victim was a young adult, it's difficult to be more precise. She does not show any signs of arthritis, not, not uh, severe arthritis. If you look at her spinal column, there's only minor changes, no development of arthritis. Her pubic bones are showing a stage of maturity that would be consistent with somebody that is about 30 years of age. In a young person, the sutures of the skull are plainly visible. As a person grows older, the sutures tend to fuse together. In the victim's skull, the sutures are starting to disappear, confirming that the victim was a young adult. Only five feet, one inch tall, she'd been stabbed repeatedly the knife blade leaving marks on the collarbone, ribs, and vertebrae. Looking at the pattern of cuts in the bone, you can tell that the individual was, was behind her at least some of the time. Uh, she has knife wounds that penetrated in, in the back and the midline. Uh, the cut that is in the, in the clavicle and the collarbone there's many different positions that could account for that, but one would be the individual reaching over her. Attaching a name to the body will not be easy. To shed more light on this mysterious case, police must determine the identity of the victim. In Fort Myers, Florida, police will have the opposite problem a crime without a body. 911, what is your emergency? Yeah. Okay, one moment, sir. Betty, I have a man on the phone advised he just murdered someone. In a police communication center in Fort Myers, Florida, a 911 call will lead to the discovery of a grisly crime dating to 1989. 911, what is your emergency? I'd like to report a homicide on Piney Road. A uh, murder? Where did it happen? I'm only calling in because I should confess that's what I did. And you did it? Yeah. The caller reports a murder he has recently committed. Why did you do that? I don't know. He says he's thought of turning himself in, but hasn't decided yet. Right, are you going to wait there for us? The 911 call is traced to a shopping center phone booth. The operator tries to keep the killer on the line, while a message goes out to police units in the area. Lake County 2, 11, 1, 1065, a possible signal 5 at Coral Gate Shopping Center. Or Orange Grove in Pondella. Orange Grove in Pondella. Officer Paul Rose monitors the call and finds no one at the shopping center phone booth where the call originated. But less than a mile from the shopping center, he has spotted a possible suspect. The suspect had been walking hurriedly at the side of the road, away from the direction of the shopping center. 
The suspect, whose name is Paul Klein, quickly admits he made the 911 call confessing murder. He is advised of his rights and taken into custody. The previous night, he'd broken into a house and strangled an elderly woman on the couch where she lay. There is no sign of anything missing. Robbery had not been the motive. Lieutenant Jeff Taylor, entering the house, found the victim just as Klein had described her. But he would soon find out that she had not been Klein's first victim. Klein related to me that he heard voices, and the voices made him become angry. And every time he became angry, he had to kill someone. And when he said that, it indicated to me that perhaps there were other victims also. And I asked him at that time uh, if he had killed before, and he said yes twice. Klein had murdered one other woman in a trailer some months before. But his first victim had been a friend named Danny Webster, killed a year and a half earlier in August 1989. Luring Webster into a field to look for aluminum cans, Klein had beaten him to death with a lead pipe. A crime scene search unit scours the area where the killing allegedly occurred. There you go, I got something over here. Oh, yeah? What is it? Work Does it look like it's been there a while, or? We had information that we believed at the time that um, the crime was committed, the, the original act of the homicide was committed in this field. So what we did, we did a grid search of this whole field and upon doing that, we located a shoe. Uh, it's early to tell right now if it actually belongs to the victim, but we believe there's a good possibility that it does. Therefore, once we found the, uh, the shoe, we have to treat it as evidence. According to Klein's confession, he had returned to the scene of the crime three days after the murder. Arriving at night to avoid detection, he swam with the body to a marshy swamp island, where he dismembered the corpse with an axe and a paring knife. After disposing of Webster's body so thoroughly and getting away with his crime for a year and a half, Klein has now decided to confess. The crime scene search officers find a small piece of bone, photographed exactly where it is found. But they will not find a body. Without a body, police do not have enough evidence to convict. Detective Jack Shell interrogated Klein under tight security. Klein had once bent a stop sign with his bare hands. We needed a positive identification of the body. Although we had somebody telling us who they killed and that they killed them, we still have to prove who was killed, how they were killed, and when they were killed to the best we can. It's the uh, corpus delecti, the body of the crime. We have to be able to establish that, yes, this person died, and that this person did it. I, mean, I guess I must have actually hit him about, I don't know, maybe more than 200 times. I'm not sure. I just kept whacking at everything. On, I hit him in the legs, the arms, everywhere I could get his face. I, just his head the region was more where I actually hit more than anything. But uh, that was after he was already dead, too, you know, I just kept hitting him. Klein's confession by itself is not enough to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The police must find the body. Klein pointed out the marshy island where he says he left the dismembered corpse. 
But even if police can find it, it will be hard to identify after a year and a half in the swamp. The taller bush. The taller bush. The case will go to Dr. William Maples of the University of Florida, a world-renowned authority on the identification of skeletal remains. In 1991, he led the team that exhumed the bones of President Zachary Taylor, who died mysteriously in 1850. Some historians say Taylor was poisoned, making him, not Abraham Lincoln, the first American president to be assassinated. After testing the dead president's hair and fingernails for poison, Dr. Maples laid the body and the assassin theories to rest. In the case of Paul Klein, it is immediately clear to Maples he is dealing with a possible psychopath totally unaffected by death. Well, bodies in Florida tend to bloat very rapidly. Florida is known for its sunshine and good weather, especially in the area of Fort Myers where this took place. Uh, so the first thing that our uh, killer attempted to use was a paring knife. Uh, it is very flexible, it is light, it may be sharp, it may be uh, serrated, and may be very, very effective sometimes in cutting up bones. The, the so-called Ginzu steak knife is amazingly flexible and yet will go right through bone if it's properly used. Uh, so our killer sticks the knife into this bloated body and out pours all over him yellow and green discharge, foul-smelling fluid. Uh, this is enough to, to really disturb anyone, even if they, they weren't disturbed to start with. But the killer's use of a paring knife may be the key to identifying the victim's remains and corroborating Klein's confession. If we take a paring knife and rub uh, along a stick or a bone, or whatever the case might be, you notice that the blade jumps and chatters. Uh, this chatter produces a, an interrupted type of cutting on the bone surface. And we look for this evidence of chattering, and that tells us how flexible or inflexible the blade is. On the other hand, if we take a good heavy bladed sharp knife and cut on the bone. It doesn't chatter, it simply shaves the bone. And this is evidence of a heavier, less flexible blade. Crime scene search officers arrive at the island where Klein left the dismembered body. If they can find bones that were sliced with a paring knife, they'll have strong proof that Klein's confession is real. Hey Chris, how you doing? We're gonna earn this one. We're gonna earn this one. Klein was to have accompanied the officers himself, but in the boat going over to the island, he'd been much too excited at the prospect of seeing his victim's remains. For their own safety, the officers decided to search without Klein's assistance. It's a serious mission, for unlike his other crimes, the murder of Danny Webster was vicious enough to send Klein to Florida's electric chair, or else prove beyond all doubt he's a dangerous psychopath to be put away indefinitely. He seemed like a normal person. Uh, you didn't notice any psychological problems or anything, but the more it went on and the more I realized he was telling me the truth and that these gory facts he was telling me really did happen, then I'm beginning to think, you know, we've got, got a real weirdo here that can do this and talk about it so calmly and so intelligently. Klein had a nickname he didn't like. Because his arms extended out from his body as he walked, kids made fun of him, calling him Popeye. That, uh, that what I did is, He'd uh, killed Danny Webster for calling him names, repeating time after time it was because Webster had harassed him. How are you feeling? 
Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, everything's all right. I just uh, have to go ahead and, I don't know, I think I feel almost a little dizzy for that matter. I have to eat a little bit of something, take my medication. Is that person yeah. in the marsh, Danny Webster? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yep, that's him. Or that, that well, was why him. Did, why did uh, you tell him? Uh, he was always being cruel and, I don't know, calling me names and stuff. And I decided to go for it. Watch your head, Hey, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate everything. The island where Klein left the body is partially submerged and subject to changing tides. The logistics of finding evidence are very difficult. Finally, more bones are found. The body is in pieces, just as Klein had said. I asked him, how did you take this body apart? I believe his response was just like I always do. I took off the left leg, the left arm, the head, the right arm, the right leg, in a circular motion like that. And he had used a hatchet, axe. He told me where the axe was, which was in another state. Him and his father had went to uh, their home in another state and left it there before he came back. Pieces of bone found on the marshy island are sent to the FBI for examination. The FBI confirms that the bones show evidence of hatchet trauma. An axe or hatchet had been used to cut the body apart. But according to his harrowing confession, Klein had reserved special treatment for the victim's head. Yeah, you have got his head off with the parry knife and, and the head, uh, there was more or less like in pieces and I tossed it right on an embankment about 25, 30 feet from the mangroves and I stuck it there for like, uh, see, I had it there for like the longest time, I guess something like three and a half months. He told me that he would, he took the head and kept it to come back and visit it. He would visit it every night and talk to it. And after about two weeks, it got to the point where it was deteriorated to the extent that he didn't want it anymore, so he discarded it. Klein had carried the head around with him in a paper sack, often engaging it in conversation. Spotting a police car on one occasion, he panicked and threw the head into a waterway, but he could not remember where. A police dive team searches the area where Klein may have discarded Danny Webster's skull. It is an area of murky waters, frequented by alligators. They find nothing but coconuts. Unless the head is found, it may be impossible to identify the remains as those of Danny Webster. Here, as in suburban Virginia, the police must team up with science to bring a killer to justice. At the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., tourists gaze at the wonders of the natural world. They are unaware that a few feet away, a storage area holds the unnatural work of a vicious killer. Police in Fairfax County, Virginia, have called on forensic scientist Doug Owsley to help identify the victim of a brutal homicide. The body has decomposed. Only a skeleton remains. Owsley has determined that the victim was a female from 27 to 34 years old. She died from repeated stab wounds. But who is she and where did she come from? When you're, when you're working with police cases and working on problems of human identification, often 
when the remains come into the laboratory or when you're involved in the recovery, the identification follows very quickly. There's someone that's missing, there are records that can be obtained, dental records or medical records that you can compare against and you can get that person identified within a very short period of time. Okay. All right. Well, if we can help, we'll just try. But uh, police in Fairfax do, County have found no immediate links to a missing person. What's your phone number? Owsley will need every piece of evidence he can find to produce a life history of the victim to be matched, hopefully, with someone who disappeared as many as six years before. Personal effects found with the victim are minimal. An inexpensive hair clip, a hair pick. Her blue jeans had rotted away. Her synthetic underwear remained. Lightweight sandals indicate that the crime was committed in warm weather. Her hair was a light brown color, as, as determined from analysis of hair found at the, at, the, at the site. We know that her fingernails were painted from fingernails that were recovered at the site. Uh, it was a, a dark, glossy pink in color. So there's a lot of details. On the earrings found near the body is a fragment of human tissue. The metal of the earring had protected it from bacterial decay. The earrings are included in sketches distributed nationwide. Slowly, painfully, the haunting details of the victim's life are coming into focus. In the spinal column are signs of trauma. Depressions in the vertebra are evidence that the discs between the vertebrae have herniated. The victim may have held a job that required heavy lifting. She'd once taken care of her teeth, but in the last years of her life had allowed them to decay. She had fillings on the front teeth to maintain her appearance, but five of her molars are missing. Black stains on the teeth are evidence the victim was probably a smoker. Overall, the, the impression that you would have, but it's an impression based not only on the dentition, but perhaps some of the things found with it. It, it would suggest that it was an individual that, that did not have a lot of money, that uh, fairly, fairly limited financial resources. The information gleaned by Owsley is passed on to the Fairfax County Police Department, where Detective Bruce Guth heads the homicide branch. In, in our jurisdiction, uh, many of the murders are um, committed by people who know, know the victim. In the normal case, once the victim yeah, is known, the police will talk to neighbors and relatives about the victim's lifestyle, who her friends were, and her enemies. A chain of evidence often will lead to the guilty party. In this case, we don't know the identity, so it makes it difficult to to uh, really go much further till we know who it is. Detail by detail, Fairfax County Police re-examine the evidence found at the scene. A sketch of what the victim may have looked like is distributed to police across the country, along with other details of the case. Even though this case is two years old, I'm still actively pursuing leads that have occurred. I receive inquiries approximately two to three a month. Uh, just recently, I received one from Philadelphia, New York City, and Ohio. Uh, Despite the continuing efforts of the Fairfax County Police, there is no matchup of the murder victim with a missing person. To facilitate the search for the victim's identity, Doug Owsley provides data for a second composite sketch using an FBI computer program. When you, when you look at a skull and you're trying to assess what this individual looked like, the basic form is going to be defined by the skull itself. In relation to that, then you take into consideration the clothing that's found, for instance, because the clothing helps you, you gain a, an idea as to the size, the weight of the individual, for instance. Starting with an image of the skull, the computer adds successive layers of detail. Markers indicate the probable thickness of facial tissue. The measurements are based on population studies of similar age and gender. 
hair found at the scene, along with the plastic hair clip and hair pick, suggest a possible hairstyle. The victim had an overbite, a gap in her front teeth, and a cosmetic filling. Since these features would have been visible in life, the victim is shown smiling in the final illustration. But despite the pains taken to create a lifelike image, there is still no response when the image is published nationwide. Part of the problem, the police are still unsure when the murder occurred. When discovered in 1993, the bones had been dry. The flesh had long since rotted away. You'd have to say that it would be at least a year and a half before that that this could have happened. But in reality, I think it could extend back further in time. And so if we take the, the maximum range, one of the things found in a pocket was a quarter that dates to 1980. So looking at the time frame, we're, we're in terms of the extremes, probably talking between 1991 and 1980. The problem of dating murder victims found long after the crime has occurred may soon have an answer. At a body farm in Tennessee, an unusual study is underway using the volunteered flesh and bones of the dead. In Fairfax County, Virginia, police continue their search for clues to identify a woman found in the Washington suburbs. In Fort Myers, Florida, a confessed serial killer has led police to a headless body, barely identifiable as human. In both cases, work done at the Tennessee Anthropology Research Facility, or TARF, will prove invaluable. Its director is Dr. William Bass, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. His expertise is the human skeleton. Individual who'd been dead about 10 days found out on the edge of the river. When a person is recently dead, morphological features such as prints on the fingers and palms can help with identification. When these features are gone and only the bones remain, the case is one for forensic anthropology. Bass's facility receives on average one body a week for identification. Parts of Tennessee have become a dumping ground for murder victims. We don't think of the interstates as being avenues of crime, but they're absolute avenues of crime. So you can kidnap somebody in Chicago. You can come down I-75, which comes down through Cincinnati, through Lexington, Kentucky, into Tennessee. The first real area that you get to on I-75 going toward Florida that is really rural is Tennessee. And we get a lot of bodies thrown out there. With so many bodies, Bass has invented a boxing system for storage. Every skeleton gets his own box. So we, uh, you want to box them because if you don't, they will get lost, they will get dirty. On the shelves surrounding him are over 2,000 skeletons sent to Bass's facility by medical examiners around the state. With the help of graduate students, Bass assists the police in determining the sex, race, and other identifying characteristics of unclaimed bodies. But in doing his work, Bass became acutely aware there were no reliable statistics on rates of human decay. He established near Knoxville an outdoor preserve known informally as the Body Farm. Here, he has planted not living things, but dead. Human bodies left in the open to decompose. It's an experiment that will tell him how bodily decomposition is affected by weather, climate, and the degree of exposure to the elements. This is a body that we're studying, uh, the effects of, of the covering of the body that the maggots leave. This body has been outside for a year. Maggots have eaten its inside away, but left some of the skin for protection. Maggots don't like sunlight, and 
uh, what they do is they leave this as an umbrella to protect themselves from the sun. And so you get bodies like this um, that will have the covering on them holding the bones together, um, although there are no internal organs left there at all. The specimens used for Bass's experiments come from two basic sources, those who have donated their bodies to science and unclaimed bodies sent to the facility by medical examiners. After the bodies have lain in the open to decompose, they are brought back to the laboratory for analysis. Dissection will tell how their exposure to the elements has affected their skin, bones, and tissue. These statistics will then aid police departments in determining how long a newly discovered homicide victim has been dead. To keep out intruders with morbid curiosities, security guards keep the body farm under tight surveillance. Bass has attempted to duplicate all the common ways in which killers dispose of their victims. Well, we try to keep as honest a setting as we can. Uh, we try not to make anything artificial. It's, it's exactly the way it is in nature. What we have here is an, is an automobile that we have been looking at the decay rates of people in automobiles, both in the passenger compartment and in the trunk. A body placed in the trunk for observation has since been removed, but its byproducts remain. Tiny pupil cases from which flies have emerged. A matter of minutes after death has occurred, flies are attracted to the body to lay their eggs. The eggs will hatch into larvae, or maggots, that feed on the decaying flesh before turning into flies. We can tell you that this individual has been in this trunk at least 21 days from the fly pupae that are, are present, from the pupil cases that are, are present here. In the back seat of the car, another body has been removed, yep. again leaving a clue as to time of death. Hair mass. What's called the hair mass falls off a dead body after a week's time. Bass has found that in enclosed vehicles, the buildup of heat often accelerates the process of decomposition. Some of the bodies have been dead only a week. Well, he hadn't gone very far. We'll Well, they're both at about the same stage, aren't they? That's on that body. Others are much older. Well, there are there are some maggots right there, but that maggot is frozen. Uh, he's gotten away from the warmth of the body and uh, didn't make it back to the body, so there are a couple right there. I'm going to push this back just a little bit more here, and uh, we'll see if we can't get under there. And not really sure. Well, you see, there are lots of maggots. See, there are hundreds and hundreds of maggots in there. Uh, and they are either slowed down, they're not, they're not doing much right now because it's so cold. Each month, Bass sends bone and hair samples to the FBI for analysis. The samples come from a number of different specimens in a variety of locales within the farm. The FBI will study how time, exposure to the elements, and the environment in which a body is found may alter its DNA. You can do DNA analysis on the maggots, and they will produce the same DNA. If the individual has um, has been on drugs, the maggots will pick up those drugs. You can tell from analysis of the maggot. Also, the volatile fatty acids, which are that, the goo that you see there, those are what are called the volatile fatty acids that leach out of bodies. Now, we've been able to take this material and analyze that and determine the length of time since death up to about two years. In other parts of the facility, bodies lie in coffins above ground. 
Drainage tubes allow the testing of fluids and air samples without opening the coffin lid. This is Nearby, bodies are buried in coffins six feet underground with a culvert allowing access. Here, Bass and his associates study how subterranean burial affects the rate of decay. Since killers have been known to dismember their victims and scatter them around, another area is set aside for body parts. It is not always an exact science. But Dr. Bass's work, the first of its kind, will help the police with murder victims found long after the crime. In the case of Danny Webster in Florida, police have only part of the body. The killer has done a thorough job of dismembering and scattering the remains. Filling in the grisly details of murder and mutilation will be the job of forensic science. At the Lee County Sheriff's Office in Fort Myers, Florida, Paul Klein has confessed to the murder of Danny Webster. But the killer has carved up the body and disposed of its head. The few bones found on a marshy island are a year and a half old. It may be impossible to prove beyond a reasonable doubt they are the bones of Danny Webster. We in, we come back out, so Klein had been relentless in attempting to conceal his crime. Before decapitating the body, he had pulled out the teeth, knowing they're often used to identify the victim. He explained that instead of digging a normal grave-type hole, that he dug a round hole as if to put trash or something in it. He set the victim down in it, buttocks first, and shoved him into the hole by his shoulders. When he didn't go in all the way, he jumped up and down on the body until he was able to get it deep enough into the hole that he thought he had it hidden. Then he pulled weeds and dirt over it and laid on his belly, and his words were slithered back into the water like a big gator and swam back home. Is Klein a psychopath, or is he a man who has plotted and planned the perfect crime? Okay, a perfect crime. Let's think, how about Jimmy Hoffa? How far have we gotten on Jimmy Hoffa solving? We don't even know where he is. How can we solve the crime if we don't know where he is? You see, so somebody, I mean, somebody's already thought of this. And so, you know, if you leave the body, it's a good chance you're going to be caught. Because there's all these hair and fiber sections of the FBI and the forensic anthropologists of the world all over. All my colleagues were out there trying to figure this out. But if you don't have a body, how do you know you've got a crime, you say? Detective Harry executed a search warrant at Klein's apartment. It was soon apparent Klein may have learned the techniques of killing from books. Um, we found uh, probably every true life murder story that was ever written, uh, like Son of Sam, uh, The Hillside Strangler. It was just book after book after book. From sparse remains, forensic science must identify the body of Danny Webster. If not, the case may be lost. In order to corroborate Klein's confession and make the case hold up in court, anthropologist William Maples will try to determine the age, sex, and race of the partial skeleton. This is the shaft of the bone. This is the epiphysis, the end of the bone. And they start from separate origins in a child. Um, and they slowly change shape. As the epiphyses reach the end of their growth, they become fused to the shafts of bone. On the bones in this case, fusion is not yet complete. Maples is able to put the age of the victim between 17 and 23, the same age as Danny Webster. Determining sex is almost always a matter of studying the pelvic bones, narrower in males than females. The victim in this case was clearly a male. But determining race will be more difficult, especially with the head missing. Dr. Maples uses the femur, or thigh bone, to distinguish Caucasian and black. In a Caucasian, the femur is bowed enough to allow his knuckle to pass under. In the case of a black individual, the shaft 
tends to be much flatter and straighter, and there is no anterior bowing. The amount of curvature in the femur clearly indicated to me that we were dealing with a white male. Finally, Maples examines the bones for evidence of the chatter marks that a paring knife would leave if used to dismember the body. Killers, by and large, aren't stupid enough to use paring knives. So we don't have a lot of evidence of that. But the results are positive. By the end of his examination, Maples has conclusive proof that the bones match the description of Danny Webster. The necessary corroboration of Klein's confession is in place. For Lieutenant time. Jeff Taylor, the case is closed. Um, Paul Klein is presently in um, an institution uh, in Chattahoochee, Florida for um, uh, mentally insane. But in Fairfax County, Virginia, police have a tougher problem. A murder victim remains unidentified. A killer may go undetected, free to kill again. More than two years have passed since the discovery of a female body in the Virginia countryside near Washington, D.C. Fairfax County investigators, including detectives Jerry Farrell and Dennis Wilson, have sent out extensive information on the case, including descriptions of the victim, dental charts, and a description of some, but not all, of the wounds discovered by forensic expert Doug Owsley. Persons have been known to confess crimes they did not commit, having learned the details of the crime from public sources. By withholding certain information, the police can be sure when a confession is fabricated or genuine. Right, this is going to be the cut right here. Far from having a confession, police in Fairfax County, after two years of searching missing person files, still do not know who the victim is. Even today, we think a lot about her and, and are, are hoping that through the facial reproductions that have been done, that someone might be able to recognize her, might be able to contact the police and offer new insights, because this is, this is somebody that we need to get identified and we certainly need to, to, in order to hopefully prevent this from happening again, find out who did this. We've sent hundreds of leads out, hundreds of posters. Uh, we're going to probably revise this again at least once or twice a year. We try to cover it on the TV stations, the media. Uh, we try to get the uh, newspapers interested to run the picture. We run not only the artist renditions, but we also run pictures of the clothing. Uh, this is no way a case that's just sitting on a shelf and nothing being done. With a growing population and more and more people on the move, many crimes may never be solved. Victims like the one found in Fairfax County her friends and relatives unaware of her death may remain unidentified, her killer free to kill again. I think that uh, homicide investigations are getting a little more difficult. Uh, the national trend is more stranger on stranger murders, as in past years it was family members, domestic kind of murders. Uh, nationally there's more stranger, stranger murders. And forensics becomes a very important part of the investigation. Was this the work of a serial killer? Doug Owsley believes not. The body was buried in haste, the killer lacking the tools to dismember it so it would never be found. Serial killers, like Florida's Paul Klein, are far more efficient. You don't gain necessarily that same sort of sophistication in this case. Certainly it led to a tragic end, but uh, in terms of accomplishing what he set out to do, he was, he was much less prepared. On the other hand, um, he was able to take someone's life and he's been able to get away with it all these years, and so, and so there's, there's just some piece that we haven't uh, been able to put together to, to get on his trail yet. Despite the obstacles to solving the case, detectives in Fairfax County have not given up. Somebody sooner or later is going to talk about this. That's one of the premises of a cold case squad, that relationships are changing and... Uh, Technology's changing, things are becoming more advanced. 
I'm optimistic that this case could get solved. It's, uh, we keep working at it, chipping away at it. Eventually, it's gonna it's gonna unfold. Oh yeah, I optimistic. Believe we're gonna do it. Sometimes things just take a little bit longer. That's all. William Maples, for one, believes that few killers escape detection. No, no, of course not. They, they don't play by our rules. Uh, they, they will take chances, do things that we wouldn't do. Uh, they, they just don't play by the rules. And that's helpful to us because that means that they make a lot of mistakes. And by taking chances, they invariably end up getting caught. Thrill is a big element in them. And thrill means that they're taking chances. And God love them. The more chances they take, the more chances we have of catching them. Investigators are on the trail of a serial killer leaving behind a series of almost invisible clues. In Maine, police depend on a few paltry fibers to sew up a case against a deadly rapist. The evidence is in hand, but they have nothing to compare it against. Florida investigators confront a fast car, a fatal accident, an unlikely story. And forensic scientists use fibers from the crash scene to find out what really happened. Tiny filaments, practically invisible to the naked eye, are the key to solving these crimes. In the lab, scientists can weave the truth from the shreds of evidence. In 1981, a peaceful hike in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, ended with a grim discovery. The body of a young man was lying at the edge of a field. For Atlanta police, it was the kind of scene that was becoming all too familiar. For 21 months, more than two dozen bodies had turned up in fields, empty lots, and less traveled roads. The victims were young African-American males. Some were children. Most were strangled. At first, the crimes were investigated routinely. But as the murder count climbed, it became clear a serial killer was on the loose he would leave few clues in his deadly wake. Parents of the victims demanded answers. And as more bodies turned up, police assembled a task force to find a link among the murders and to trace every clue. But the murders continued. Lawmen from the surrounding area joined citizens, even psychics, in the search for victims and their killer a reward fund reached $100,000, but no one came forward to claim it. Racial tensions grew as panic gripped this southern city. Assuming the crimes were racially motivated, police looked for a white male, and the outcry for justice in the African-American community grew deafening. As the death toll climbed past 20, Investigators hoped it was only a matter of time before they caught the killer. But time was their enemy, and they had few clues. At the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, microanalyst Larry Peterson set his sights on the almost invisible clues known as trace evidence. 
I began applying more or less full-time efforts into looking at the cases individually and also comparing them to see if they were related. Peterson was counting on fiber evidence to be the common thread that bound killer and victims. By their nature, fibers are easy to pick up, hard to brush off. They provide a nearly invisible record of every place a person visits. By the same token, every victim was literally covered in hundreds of fibers, most of them meaningless. To find out which strands were important required a concentrated effort. Each fiber collected from one victim had to be visually compared against hundreds pulled from the next. Multiply that by 20 victims, and investigators were examining hundreds of thousands of fibers. The task could easily stretch into months. It's hard to determine automatically what bits of material are important that could be from, let's say, a killer's environment, what bits of material is from the victim's own home, from places that they frequent. Using a stereo microscope that renders the fiber evidence in three dimensions, Peterson analyzed fibers culled from the crime scenes and during autopsies. Their length, shape, and texture suggested some were from a household carpet, others were from an automobile. I was still looking for any other kind of evidence that may link different cases together in addition to the ones I had already found. After scanning hundreds of samples, Peterson singled out fibers with similar characteristics. On most of the bodies, he kept coming across purple acetate fibers as well as yellow-green fibers that appeared to be from a carpet. As the evidence began to accumulate, he needed more specialized microscopes. To see if they were from the same source, he placed the carpet fibers on a high magnification comparison microscope. It allowed him to compare the fibers side by side. Their colors and shapes matched. Peterson was encouraged. Perhaps that was the link he needed. He now had proof that all the victims were connected in some way and that they were probably killed by the same person. If he could figure out where the fibers came from, he could catch the killer. Fortunately, the fiber had an unusual structure. If he could locate its manufacturer, he'd be that much closer to solving the case. That required comparing the fiber against the hundreds of samples submitted by carpet manufacturers, an interminable and painstaking job that would add more weeks to the investigation. He couldn't do it alone. Hal Dedman, the FBI's master microanalyst, signed on to help. My initial role was to assist the Georgia Crime Laboratory in attempting to identify these fibers to see if the manufacture of these fibers could be identified. While the search for the elusive fiber wore on, young men and boys were dying. And Atlanta was scared. As the city's anguish continued, Hyde Post of the Atlanta Journal covered the story. The mood of the city during most of the investigation was was a, a real strong feeling of helplessness. Desperate for leads, Atlanta police canvassed victims' neighborhoods and streets near where bodies were found. They questioned people door to door, looking for any piece of information that might help them. At night, Patrol cars searched the neighborhoods looking for anyone suspicious. On the streets, police had few leads. But in the lab, microanalysts were getting closer to pinpointing an original source for the unique fiber. The media caught wind that investigators were using trace evidence to tie the Atlanta area murders together. But publishing the news didn't stop the killer. It only made him change his tactics. 
suddenly, instead of in the woods or dumped by the roadside, the bodies began to show up in water. The victims found in the rivers were either nude or partially clothed. Was the murderer trying to eliminate fiber evidence from being traced back to him? Lawmen suspected as much. Without alerting the media, and armed with the knowledge that the killer was now disposing of the bodies in water, scores of police recruits staked out Atlanta's bridges. They were fishing for a murderer that had eluded them for 22 months. Week after week, the recruits would secretly assemble under the bridges to keep their vigil. For all their efforts, officers dubbed them trolls. All they could do was wait for the killer to strike again. Around 2 a.m. on May 22, 1981, the calm along the Chattahoochee River was broken by a splash in the darkness. The trolls waiting under the James Jackson Parkway Bridge sprang into action to find the cause. But they could not see what made the splash. They radioed to nearby officers who intercepted a station wagon and questioned the driver. His name was Wayne Bertram Williams, a 23-year-old freelance photographer and self-proclaimed music promoter. Williams didn't fit the assumed profile of the killer. In fact, as a young black man, he was more likely to be a victim. Williams told police he was coming home from a nightclub where he went to hear a new act he was considering signing. As a matter of procedure, police searched his car, then took his name and address and sent him on his way. Two days later, the body of 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater surfaced in the Chattahoochee River downstream from the James Jackson Parkway Bridge. Cater, a black male whom the medical examiners determined had been strangled, fit the profile of the victims murdered in the months before. He'd been dead an estimated two days. The trace evidence collected from Cater's body was sent to Peterson. Two fibers had been extracted from the victim's hair. In structure, they matched those found on the other victims. But the color didn't match. It could have faded from the water, or it could have been a mismatch. But viewing the fibers under polarized light revealed the structure of the fibers to be identical. Police decided to take a second look at Wayne Williams. After an interview and background check, a picture of Williams developed. He was a pampered only child, a college dropout at age 19. No one had seen him at the club he said he was at the night police stopped him on the bridge. Caught in this one lie, his alibi crumbled. Williams now became their chief suspect. They obtained search warrants for his house and car. Williams, feeling he had been wrongly accused because of his race, held a news conference to proclaim his innocence. But he didn't allow the press to take pictures. They openly said, you killed Nathaniel Cater, and you know it, and you're lying to us. They said that. Some members of the African-American community also found it hard to believe that Williams could be considered a suspect. I think it was very difficult for the community to believe that an African-American uh, might have committed these crimes, that an African-American had gone about systematically killing other um, African-Americans. There was no history of black serial killers. Serial killers is a middle-aged white guy thing. 
or seem to have been. And this ran counter to that pattern. In the early 1980s, DNA testing wasn't available yet. All that forensic investigators had to go on were these small fibers. The strand seemed to point to William's guilt. His house was covered with yellowish green carpet. Peterson collected as many fiber samples as he could. He also collected dog hairs and fibers from a purplish bedspread and from the trunk liner and glove compartment of William's car. Inside these bags of evidence could lie the key to catching the murderer. Peterson was hopeful that fibers from William's house would match fibers from the victim's clothing. Took the uh, evidence back immediately to the laboratory uh, that very evening and mounted some of the samples up to see, you know, does this have any potential or not? Let's just kind of see right away. The violet acetate, along with the green carpet fibers from William's home, matched the fibers found on nearly all of the victims so far. But as strong as that evidence seemed, it simply wasn't enough. To make their case, investigators faced a staggering challenge to determine how many other people in Atlanta had the exact same carpet. Based on the fiber evidence, Wayne Williams now looked like a strong suspect in the Atlanta murders. But anyone else in Atlanta with the same taste in yellow-green carpeting would be equally suspect. Police needed more to go on. They needed to find out how much of that particular yellow-green carpet was installed in Atlanta's homes. So they dug much deeper. Microscopic analysis of the fiber structure helped identify their manufacturer. The carpet was made in the early 70s, but that particular shade was produced for just one year. A little more than 16,000 yards of the carpet had ever been sold in the southeast. In Atlanta, the calculated odds that someone owned the same kind of carpet as Williams were less than one in 8,000. The evidence was stacking against Williams, but not nearly enough to win a conviction. To narrow the field, investigators compared automobile carpet fibers found on some of the victims to the rug in William's car. It was estimated that approximately one out of 3,500 cars in the Atlanta, Georgia area might be expected to have a carpet fiber like that found on many of the victims that were linked to Wayne Williams. Put another way, the victims would have had to randomly visit 3,500 cars plus nearly 8,000 homes in order to pick up both fibers. The odds of that happening randomly were one in more than 29 million. Add to that the purple acetate fiber from the bedspread, and it became nearly impossible that the victims could have picked up these three fibers someplace else. The numbers didn't lie. Williams was arrested. To forensic scientists, the fiber evidence was overwhelming. To a panel of jurors, it might be confusing. We wrote a story at the beginning of the trial that, that the prosecution's strongest case, strongest evidence, uh, could be contained in a thimble. More than just Williams was on trial, prosecutors knew that the science that led to his arrest would also be scrutinized. The defense would do everything it could to snarl their credibility. If you do enough searches and you find another environment where there's that same green carpet, what are the odds that there'll be an automobile that had the same floorboard carpeting or that the family would possess the same blanket and bedspread and throw rugs and clothing items? That's really the key. That combination cannot exist. On February 27, 1982, Wayne Williams was found guilty of killing two men. The jury deliberated 11 hours. Ten other murders were definitely linked to him during the trial. 
and the task force closed the books on 27 murder cases between 1978 and 1981, connecting them to Williams on the same fiber evidence. The Wayne Williams case was the first time a crime was solved solely on the basis of fibers. The amount and variety of fibers found on Williams' victims snared him in a net of evidence. But in a case in Maine, investigators had far less to catch a killer. November 30th, 1990 was a brutal day in northern Maine. On that day, a worker at the Cummings Concrete Corporation in Alton called police after discovering the body of a young woman. The victim was face down. She was nude except for the socks on her feet. The rest of her clothes were piled nearby. Police on the scene contacted Detective Ed Thorne of the nearby Bangor Police Department. They knew he was working on a month-old missing persons case, and the victim fit the description of the missing woman. The state police mobile crime lab was called in. Investigators were on the trail of a killer. Potentially important clues like tire tracks or footprints had to be quickly gathered before someone accidentally or intentionally destroyed the evidence. Maine State Police crime scene investigator Craig Hanley supervised collection of evidence. According to Hanley, the very act of arriving on a crime scene can compromise the minute evidence. If the crime scene is not properly secured, we end up with contamination or con in inadvertent contamination sometimes by the officers themselves. It's very important for us to interview the first responders and to find out exactly where they walked, what they touched, what they moved, and what they removed. And if they've done the job properly, they should have everything noted so they can uh, explain this to us. There's nothing better than for a crime scene investigator to arrive on the scene and find it in a very uh, good condition. The scene's original condition was recorded on film, and notes were jotted down on paper. Soil samples and debris were collected. In a case that might hinge on microscopic evidence, there was no way of knowing what might become important. Investigators had two questions before them. Who was the victim, and who killed her? The body was taken to the medical examiner's office, where an autopsy was performed and a positive ID could be made. Her clothing and physical features matched those of 18-year-old Lisa Garland, the missing woman that Thorne had been searching for. She had been reported missing one month earlier. The medical examiner later confirmed her identification through fingerprints. Garland was last seen around 1 a.m. on October 27th, leaving the convenience store where she worked. She lived only a short distance away. Bangor police detective Ed Thorne had reason to believe that Garland arrived at her apartment after she left the store. What happened then is an open question. From there, she would have walked or got a ride down to a residence which is approximately 150 yards from the store. We know she arrives because her pocketbook, her keys to the house, some money, and all her belongings were there. The keys and valuables found in her house led police to believe that she had not left on her own. After a month, Detective Thorne and his colleague Bob Cameron saw their missing persons case turned into a homicide. The autopsy revealed the victim had been raped and killed by a blunt force to her head. Most of her internal organs were intact, preserved by the cool weather. At the Maine State Crime Laboratory, 
forensic chemist Chris Montagna analyzed trace evidence collected from the crime scene. Most notably, the socks the victim was wearing at the time of her death. He was hoping they would hold some small clue to the killer's identity. We knew that one of the key pieces of evidence that we're going to be looking at are these socks. I began to process the socks simply by doing a visual examination, seeing what I could find, if there was any hairs or fibers, uh, grass, anything that might be from the environment of the perpetrator. He found maroon fibers. Experience told him they were from the carpet of an automobile. In terms of clues, it wasn't much. But Montagna felt the entire case could hang by this one thread of evidence. In July 1991, a 15-year-old girl was riding her bike on a lonely road in York, Maine, more than 200 miles south of Bangor. A car slowly approached and forced her off the road. She fell into the grassy embankment. The driver got out of the car and dragged the girl into the woods. There, he raped her, stabbed her, and left her for dead. Amazingly, she survived. After her attacker left, she found her way to a neighbor's house where she called for help. At the York Police Department, she picked out her attacker from the mugshot file. The suspect was a convicted rapist named David Fleming, who had been released from prison just nine months earlier. In a state as quiet as Maine, news of violent crime spreads fast. After months of chasing dead-end leads to find Lisa Garland's killer, Detective Thorne heard about the violent rape in York. Bangor police became interested in David Fleming. Just maybe he had something to do with Lisa Garland's death. In York, DNA taken from the rape victim matched Fleming's DNA. Fleming pleaded guilty to raping and assaulting the young woman in York. He was sentenced to 80 years. The Lisa Garland murder case was still open. Bangor detectives believe that if they could match Fleming's DNA to samples collected at the crime scene, they'd have their man. But the DNA would have to wait. In the early 1990s, DNA testing could take months. Today, it takes weeks. If police were to prove that David Fleming killed Lisa Garland, they would need to rely on more conventional evidence. In this case, carpet fibers extracted from David Fleming's car. The fibers were sent to chemist Chris Montagna. He compared them with the ones found eight months earlier on Lisa Garland's socks. Montagna placed each fiber on a separate stage of a comparison microscope to analyze them side by side. With a few adjustments, he could see that the pattern of dark and light stripes in the fibers lined up. When laid end to end, the fibers looked like one continuous strand, indicating that they came from the same source. It looked like the breakthrough investigators needed. The match allowed detectives Thorne and Cameron to trace eight-month-old evidence back to David Fleming. Detective Bob Cameron understood the importance of the fiber evidence. The fiber that was found on the victim's sock that was matched to the carpeting on the vehicle that Fleming had been driving. And it narrowed it down considerably because the fiber that matched the carpet in the car was the only year that they had put that color carpeting in those vehicles. The results were now conclusive. The fibers matched. But would this single shred of evidence be enough to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt? Fortunately, an overlooked piece of evidence was found in the victim's body bag. 
it was a small chip of wood, hardly worth keeping. But Montagna noticed that it had been squared off, leading him to believe that the wood had been machined. Successful once with carpet fibers, Montagna asked the investigators to again comb through Fleming's car, to look this time for a speck of matching wood. Inside the trunk, covered by a large cloth, lay small hand-carved wooden boats. Fleming learned to craft wood during his previous prison stints. Montagna sent the chip and the boats for analysis. The results again looked bad for Fleming. The chip was made of white pine, and so were the model boats. The wood had all been machined the same way. Now there were two strong reasons to link Fleming to Lisa Garland. The fiber evidence and the wood chip showed that Garland was in Fleming's car. But none of this evidence proved that he raped and murdered her. Establishing that Fleming killed her would be much more difficult. He appeared to have an airtight alibi. Around the same time Lisa Garland disappeared, he was in the hospital with serious injuries. Lisa Garland was last seen alive when she finished her shift at the convenience store in Bangor around 1 a.m. on October 27th. At around 6 a.m. that same day, David Fleming was involved in a car accident that left him hospitalized for two weeks. Fiber evidence showed that Garland was in Fleming's car. But to prove he was her killer, detectives had to pinpoint exactly when she could have been there. Fleming would have had two chances to abduct Garland. The first was in the five hours between the time she disappeared and the time he had his accident. The second was the two-week period between Fleming's release from the hospital and when Garland's body was found. An examination revealed that she was killed shortly after she was raped. But the cold weather had preserved her body and made it impossible to determine how long she'd been dead. Police knew she could not have been in Fleming's car while he was in the hospital and the car was being repaired. So if they could prove she was dead before Fleming was hospitalized, it would mean that Fleming was her killer. Police needed some way of narrowing the time frame. Bangor police learned that an aerial photo of the crime scene was taken two weeks before the victim's body was found. While examining the photos, investigators made a startling discovery. At first, it was blurry and indistinct, but an enlargement brought it into focus. There, in the pit, lay the body of Lisa Garland. Here was photographic proof that the victim was dead before Fleming was hospitalized. That meant she must have been in his car before his accident. The fiber had placed Garland in Fleming's car. The photograph established the time of death. All indications pointed to Fleming as the killer. Detectives Thorne and Cameron felt they now had all the evidence they needed to win a conviction. Then came the clincher. The analysis of the DNA from the crime scene came back from the lab. The DNA test was done at the FBI lab, and the results were that uh, Fleming was definitely a match. At the trial, the events of that night were reconstructed by the prosecution, based on police speculation. Lisa Garland did make it home just after 1 o'clock in the morning on October 27th. David Fleming had followed her from the store. As she walked into her apartment, she forgot to lock the door behind her, a simple mistake that would prove fatal. David Fleming saw his opportunity. He then went into her apartment. It's not clear where he committed the crime, but fiber evidence proved that Garland's body was in Fleming's Delta 88 before he dumped it by the sand pit in the town of Alton. Fleming then returned home. 
where his girlfriend remembered him walking in around 3 o'clock in the morning. She recalled him not sleeping soundly and leaving around 5 a.m. About an hour later, Fleming got into an accident with an 18-wheeler. He was out of commission for two weeks, but the evidence showed he had already committed his crime. The fiber evidence linked the victim to his car. The photograph established an approximate time of her death. And the car accident closed his window of opportunity to just a sliver. On March 22, 1995, David Fleming was convicted of raping and murdering Lisa Garland. He is serving a life sentence on top of the 80 years for the rape in York. In case after case, fiber evidence has linked victims to their killers. But in a case in Florida, investigators relied on fibers to reconstruct the circumstances of a fatal car accident. On a road in Tallahassee, Florida, in 1994, a mild October evening turned terribly tragic. Strewn among broken beer bottles, snapped tree limbs, and mangled car parts, lay the lifeless body of 30-year-old Michael Manella. A second victim, named Curtis Davison, was able to summon help before returning to the scene and collapsing. As paramedics treated Davison, Tallahassee police sized up the scene of the fatal accident. For crash investigators, time is even more critical than at a homicide investigation. At a homicide, officers can cordon off the crime scene and return to it later. Not so with a car wreck. Officers get just one chance to collect evidence. Traffic must return to normal as soon as possible. Crash investigators often rely on eyewitness accounts as a first source of information. But no one had seen this late night crash. No one other than survivor Curtis Davison, and he was in no condition to make a statement. Crash homicide investigator Mike Walker had to rely on preliminary judgments based on the evidence he saw at the accident scene. And what really struck me Im immediately was uh, the passenger side of the vehicle was totally destroyed. The passenger door was nearly torn off the vehicle. We had an intact driver's side of the vehicle. To Walker, that meant the passenger of the car would have sustained the most severe injuries. It was doubtful he could have survived, let alone walk away from the crash. But Davison told police he was the passenger. By some fluke, that may have been true. But could it be possible that Davison was lying to avoid being prosecuted for his friend's death? It was Walker's job to find out the truth. Investigators questioned anyone who might have seen the men before the crash. Witnesses told police that the two met at a local bar after work where they had several drinks. They were then seen in another bar later that evening. Around 1 a.m., they left the bar and drove off together. But no one saw them get into the car. Without any witness, the detectives would have to rely on forensics to tell them who was driving. They first had to determine all they could about the crash and what factors were involved like how fast the car was traveling. Returning to the crime scene the next morning, Walker and his partner, David Folsom, found the clues they needed. The 300ZX suspect vehicle was traveling northbound on this road as it rounded the curve. 
he began to lose control. The driver turned the wheel to follow the curve, but the car's inertia kept it moving forward. As it left the road, it began to spin. Then it hit a tree. The vehicle continued sliding sideward, striking another tree. As it struck the other tree, it went airborne, approximately 40 feet, landing back in the road. When a fast-moving vehicle changes direction, the tires slide sideways, leaving scuff marks on the road. By measuring these marks, called critical speed scuffs, and factoring in the friction of the road surface, investigators can calculate how fast the car was moving as it sped out of control. The measurements from the critical speed scuff uh, indicated that the vehicle was traveling at 89 to 96 miles per hour. Almost from the start of the investigation, police had a hunch alcohol played a role. Broken beer bottles were found at the scene, and paramedics and officers detected alcohol on Davison's breath and on Manella's body. If Davison was the driver and was under the influence at the time, investigators needed to test his blood alcohol level, and quickly. A blood sample was taken within two hours of the crash. So what time did you start? It's very important that once we establish that there's suspicion that he is the driver of a vehicle, then we have to obtain a blood sample because alcohol dissipates from the system. Walker and Folsom ordered the blood work that morning. The sample was taken to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab to determine its alcohol level. First, the analyst takes a carefully measured portion of the blood she wants to test and places it into a clean, labeled vial. The alcohol in the blood is volatile. As the blood is shaken, it evaporates into the air or headspace of the vial. It's the components of the blood in the headspace and not the blood itself that's tested. The gas in the headspace is drawn into a chromatograph, which identifies its components and their concentration. The computer looks specifically for alcohol in the blood gases. In 10 minutes, it provides a reading. The results showed Davison's blood alcohol level at 0.04 safely below Florida's legal limit. But that was the level when his blood was drawn at the hospital, not the level he had at the time of the accident. Because alcohol dissipates from the bloodstream at a consistent rate, the analyst can calculate what the level was two hours earlier when the accident occurred. Davison's level at the time of the crash was estimated to be between 0.06 and 0.08. In Florida, a level as low as 0.051 can be considered driving under the influence. But investigators still had to prove that he was behind the wheel. Back at his office, Walker pored over the accident scene photos and compared them to his notes. Parts of Davison's story weren't adding up. First was the car's restraining system. Walker recalled the driver's side airbag had been deployed. Airbags, by design, pin the driver in place. If Manella were driving, it seemed unlikely he'd have been thrown from the vehicle. Yet his body was found some 50 feet from where the car came to rest. On the other hand, the passenger's side seat belt looked like it hadn't even been used. Whoever sat here could have been thrown. One more clue aroused suspicion. A bloody handprint on the outside of the driver's side door. It was too smudged to read, but it seemed likely it was made when the driver exited the car after the accident. But according to Folsom, the evidence could be misleading. Now, traditionally, we cannot say that just because there's a bloody handprint that someone 
uh, driving that car put it there because there's such thing as scene contamination. One of the rescue personnel or one of the police officers could have done it. But it was enough to spur suspicion as to who was actually the driver, the deceased or the survivor. By themselves, the evidence of a bloody handprint, minor injuries, and an unused seatbelt meant very little. Taken together, they created serious doubt about Davison's story. Davison, however, was sticking to it, insisting that he was the passenger. The definitive version of the tale would be told in the lab. Investigators faced no shortage of clues about the car crash that claimed a man's life. The trick was to make sense of them. Crash investigator Mike Walker had the wreck towed to a secure impound facility for analysis. Ward Schwab is an analyst at the Department of Law Enforcement lab. One of the parts of my job as a crime scene analyst is to go and examine a vehicle without any outside influences. A lot of the times I'll go and look at the vehicle itself and try not to learn any of the particulars about the case. I'll take an objective view of the vehicle, see what I can determine, see what the evidence tells me. To piece together the particulars, he began with the driver's side seat belt, fastening it in a position as if someone were wearing it. He noticed spots on the seat belt near the door. They tested positive for human blood. That indicated the seat belt was probably worn at the time of the crash. It also meant that whoever wore it was probably not ejected from the car. Signs again pointed to Davison. The evidence was suggestive, but slippery. Even if the blood proved to be Davison's, the defense could argue that it could have spattered onto the belt while the car was spinning, or that Davison could have bled on it after the crash as he staggered around the car. To seal this case, investigators needed to find evidence that fit three criteria. First, the evidence could be left only at the moment of impact. Second, it had to be unique to the individual who left it. And third, had to prove where that person was sitting in the car. Investigators depended on fibers to meet those criteria, and they depended on regional crime lab microanalyst Paula Sauer to read them. Detectives Walker and Folsom gave Sauer several pieces of material evidence collected from the accident scene, including a dashboard with two dents in it and clothing worn by the victims. The dents in the dash were on the passenger's side. It was presumed they were caused by contact with the passenger's knees. Remarkably, the force of the crash created so much frictional heat that woven patterns and fibers were actually melted into the vinyl. There were fibers, numerous fibers, embedded in the dashboard area that would be directly in front of the passenger seat. These fibers were microscopically consistent with the fibers composing Manella's pants. The evidence seemed to indicate that Manella was in the passenger seat. But Sauer wouldn't stop there. She scrutinized every piece of evidence to be certain her results were consistent. She turned her attention to strands of human hair and synthetic fibers gathered from the cracks of the passenger side of the windshield. Michael Manella wore a hairpiece composed of both human hair and synthetic fibers. If the fibers from his hairpiece matched those in the windshield, it would strengthen the argument that he was the passenger and that Davison, the survivor of the crash, was driving. An inspection of the synthetic hairs using a high-power comparison microscope suggested the fibers in the windshield matched those in Manella's hairpiece. But analyzing these fibers required more than a visual inspection because of the small size of their molecules. To complete her comparison, Sauer used an instrument called a Foyer Transform Infrared Spectrometer, or FTIR. 
It is an instrument that is used to determine the generic class of synthetic fibers. By generic class, I mean whether it's nylon, polyester, acrylic, and this technique is very effective in that manner because it's actually looking at the molecules that are making up those fibers so it can give you an exact identification. The characteristics of both fibers were displayed on a computer. The red lines represent fibers from the hairpiece. The green lines represent fibers pulled from the windshield. In every way, they were identical. So far, all indications were that Manella was in the passenger seat. If that were true, it meant Davison would have left his mark in the area of the driver's seat, most likely on the airbag, which would have deployed at over 100 miles per hour. Sauer analyzed fibers clinging to the tightly woven fabric of the airbag. She found nine fibers matching the fabric of Davison's pants. Her conclusion? Davison was driving. Paula Sauer used her sophisticated optics to put the accident scene into focus. Not only had she placed Manella in the passenger seat, but also determined that Davison was the driver. The evidence was handed over to the state's attorney, who showed in court that Davison lied about the events that unfolded in the early morning hours of October 6, 1994. The prosecution's theory was that after a night of drinking, it was Curtis Davison who got behind the wheel of Manella's Nissan 300ZX. Anxious to test the sports car's power, Davison put it in high gear, racing down the tree-lined, two-lane road. Ignoring the 35-mile-per-hour signs, Davison climbed toward 90. Then the narrow road started to curve, and Davison lost control. No longer heeding the steering wheel, the car slid sideways and careened off an oak tree. Michael Manella, in the passenger seat, was thrown from the vehicle. He wasn't wearing a seatbelt. The sports car continued to spin out of control, smashing into another tree before coming to rest on the side of the road. Davison saved by the airbag, crawled out of the car. He went around to the passenger side to look for Manella, his bloody left hand leaving a smear on the door. Manella was dead in the road. Davison went for help. A Tallahassee jury took just 10 minutes to find Davison guilty of manslaughter by culpable negligence. He was sentenced to seven years. The analysis of tiny fibers, traces of evidence found in ordinary items, turned the tables on three men who denied any involvement in their respective crimes. The ability of forensic scientists to pinpoint the makeup of fiber down to the most microscopic detail allows prosecutors to tear alibis into shreds of evidence. In Reno, Nevada, two unidentified women are found dead. Can tiny fibers tie them to their killer? A skeleton, a shopping bag, and a single button are investigators' only clues to the identity of a woman and her killer. A sailor is killed on a Florida beach. Only a tire track in the sand marks the path to justice. The clues to murder often elude the naked eye. But no killer can escape the telltale traces of guilt.
Reno, Nevada is known as a betting town. In February of 1995, someone gambled he could kill without a trace. A transient man was searching a dumpster for things he could sell. When he made a gruesome discovery, Officers from the Reno police arrived and retrieved the body of an unidentified woman. It was almost completely camouflaged among the debris. For police, the myth of the perfect murder was dispelled long ago. Today, forensic science can win convictions from the most minute clues. But in this case, the killer seemed almost to be playing the odds. He could have disposed of the body in the desert, where no one would ever find it. Instead, he crafted an elaborate parcel, conspicuous because of its size, and hoped the dumpster would be empty before it was found. The complexity of the shroud was disturbing. The victim had been slipped into several large plastic garbage bags, which had then been carefully sewn inside a sleeping bag. The bundle was then wrapped in yellow plastic and tied with rope. The initial examination of the remains was made by the lead investigator, Detective David Jenkins. That degree of packaging was unusual because of its complexity and immediately suggested that uh, there had been a lot of preparation uh, and a lot of time involved in the packaging of the body. And that's uncommon in most body disposals. Right away, this elaborate wrapping gave police several important clues. The killer needed time to encase the victim like a modern mummy. And he needed a very private laboratory where he could do his grim work. To identify the body, detectives reviewed recent missing person reports. One case stood out. With family photographs and fingerprints, police confirmed that the victim was Catherine Powell. She had disappeared the Friday before the body was discovered. Her disappearance was first reported that next Monday, two days later, when she failed to show up to work. Miss Powell was an elementary school teacher, a very popular teacher. Uh, she was loved by her students and the other staff. And so immediately when she was reported as missing, there was a sense of urgency, uh, both by her staff and by her family, who felt that her disappearance was far more sinister than just her uh, not wanting to arrive at work. At her home, Police saw no signs of forced entry or violence. But when her family looked over the apartment, they noticed several items missing, including a laptop computer and printer, a camera, and her purse. While detectives combed her apartment, Forensics investigators poured over the evidence from the dumpster. If the wrappings held a clue to the killer's identity, investigators couldn't find it. They had never seen a case like this before. And the killer's attention to detail made them nervous. Investigators focused on the remains. The ropes and wrappings were preserved for later analysis. Police were not even sure how the victim had died. There was no indication of fatal trauma on the body. Forensic science would have to tell the story. And for an expert eye, there were many trace clues to read. 
The Washoe County Sheriff's Forensics Lab assigned the case to investigator Rich Berger. I don't really recall having attended an autopsy where there was such a profusion of uh, trace evidence potential on a person's body. There was apparent a number of blue-green strings and tufts of uh, material located basically from head to toe. Besides the fibers, Berger found a single metal shaving tangled in the victim's hair. None of these traces matched the fibers or samples gathered at the victim's apartment. Police suspected they were linked to the killer. The victim's body also bore telltale bruises. It appeared that she had been bound, gagged, and possibly tortured. The injuries suggested the killer was male. But new information suggested he hadn't worked alone. While forensic pathologists continued to gather the minute physical evidence, Detective Jenkins studied Powell's credit card records. Any recent charges might shed light on where she had been. He saw that her card was used to buy a $2,000 stereo on February 5th, the same day she disappeared. Exotic looking. Yeah, she, she, she was kind of exotic. The clerk said he'd chatted with the woman who bought the stereo. She had claimed to be Powell. So they identified themselves as Miss Powell. They were making a purchase to give to their daughter during a wedding. We were aware, having spoken with Miss Powell's family, that Miss Powell had no children. The clerk told police this woman did not fit the victim's description. He also recalled a crucial detail the kind of truck the woman drove. Remember anything, uh... Detectives traced it to its owner, a cable television installer named David Middleton. That break allowed us to focus our investigative efforts specifically on an individual rather than just the overall circumstances involving uh, her disappearance and the use of her credit cards. Police interviewed and David Middleton about Catherine Powell. Though he had recently installed cable service in her home, he said they had talked only briefly. Do you know a lady by the name of Catherine Powell? He claimed ignorance about her disappearance and murder. He knew nothing about her credit cards. But a background check revealed that Middleton was a convicted felon and a former police officer. While on duty in Miami, Middleton had lured a young woman into his patrol car, drove her to a secluded place, and sexually assaulted her. Stripped of his badge, Middleton served three years in prison. Upon release, he moved to Colorado and then to Nevada. Middleton's girlfriend was charged with fraud for using Catherine Powell's credit card. But because Middleton's truck was used in the crime, police now had grounds to search his home. We found a firearm, a shotgun. Uh, Mr. Middleton in the state of Nevada, because he is a convicted felon, was prohibited by law from possessing that weapon. Possession of the shotgun was a felony. But while it was cause for Middleton's arrest, it did not implicate him in Powell's murder. Police found no fiber evidence at his home to link him to the crime. Middleton was interrogated again. This time he changed his story. Now he admitted to beginning a sexual relationship with Catherine Powell. He said that he had been with her one night, then left for an hour. When he returned, she was dead. He refused to offer any more information. Middleton was now a prime suspect in Catherine's murder. But investigators had not a scrap of real evidence to link him to the crime. 
At the Washoe County Forensic Science Lab in Reno, the fibers found clinging to Catherine Powell's body were leading investigators nowhere. Desperate for clues, they re-examined the bruises on the victim's body. Right away, they focused on one in particular. It had an unusual crescent shape. Suspecting it was a bite mark, Detective Jenkins sought the help of forensic odontologist Raymond Rawson. Well, I saw just a few pictures of a, uh, a body that had been autopsied, and uh, there was a bruise on the, the left chest area, just uh, almost to the armpit. It was a bruise that stood out from anything else on the body, so it, uh, and it had the characteristics of a bite mark. Hoping this mark would lead them to the suspect, x-rays and plaster impressions were taken of Middleton's teeth and sent to Dr. Rawson. He wondered how hard a person would need to bite in order to leave a bruise like the one found on the victim. And if you see that, it leaves an indentation. Now, there's no bruising. And we found that you, uh, you have to actually bite so hard that you can't stand it to create a bruise. So when we see a bruise on the skin, we know that there were at least 200 pounds pressure and that that wasn't a willing situation. Somebody uh, would cry out in pain. Next, Dr. Rawson compared Middleton's bite pattern with the bruise on the victim's body. He placed the x-ray of the biting edges over a photograph of the bite mark. The details of the x-ray matched the bruise. We had one tooth that had a, uh, a wear pattern on it, and that wear pattern was shown in the, in the bruise. So it was a very good match. The bite mark confirmed that Middleton was with Powell near the time of her death. A bruise this severe was no playful love bite but neither was it evidence of murder. Police needed more concrete evidence. As news of the case spread, an anonymous informant called the police with a potential clue. Middleton had rented a large storage unit in nearby Sparks, Nevada. A search warrant was immediately served there. That information was significant because for the first time we were able to uh, locate a specific location where the kinds of activities involving the packaging of the body and the keeping of a body could have occurred. A storage unit would make a perfect workshop for a killer. Even before detectives entered the shed, they were suspicious of the amount of recent activity there. The entry records, obtained by Deputy District Attorney Tom Deloria, showed how often Middleton visited the unit. Well, we know from the gate entries, which was computerized uh, at the storage facility, that uh, Dave Middleton made numerous entries into that storage unit the Friday evening that uh, Kathy Powell was abducted from her residence. Saturday, again Sunday, again Monday, again uh, last entry being Tuesday morning. Were police walking into a glorified closet or a killer's lair? They knew their case against Middleton hinged on what they found here. At first, the shed was unremarkable crammed with personal property. And anywhere else, the duct tape and coils of rope would have seemed harmless. When they found the stereo receiver that was purchased with the victim's credit card, they knew they were on to something. Then they found the items missing from the victim's home. But police already knew Middleton had been to her apartment. Evidence of burglary does not prove murder. The handcuffs were perhaps a souvenir of Middleton's police days. 
But the scraps of women's underwear and a stun gun were not so easy to explain away. Especially in light of what they found next. Find another A refrigerator lay on its back. The freezer's bottom had been cut away and small, jagged air holes had been drilled into the sides. It had been modified, apparently to hold a human body. Above the refrigerator dangled a system of ropes and pulleys strong enough to hoist a human being. The detectives could only begin to imagine what perversions were acted out here. This was a torture chamber, simply put. Um, the refrigerator, having been placed on its back, almost suggested a, a coffin. But did Middleton's depravity go as far as murder? Investigators still had to link him to the victim. In the refrigerator, they saw small blue-green fibers and human hair. As clues, they provided a glimmer of hope in a room full of horror. The refrigerator was brought back to the crime lab, where Rich Berger analyzed the fibers. To him, the threads in the refrigerator appeared to match those found on Powell's body and genetic markers from the hair were consistent with the victims. The fibers from Powell's body were 100% cotton of a blue-green color, and that similarly those from the refrigerator were uh, composed of 100% cotton and the same color, and that also the metal fragment from Catherine Powell's hair matched the metal and paint that went into the makeup of the freezer compartment of the refrigerator. The metal shaving found in the victim's hair matched the metal from the crude air holes. Investigators found the link they were looking for. The trace evidence proved that the victim was in David Middleton's storage unit. Detectives now formed a theory of how she died. The air holes were simply inadequate to keep her alive. She had suffocated. While investigators were grappling with the monstrous acts of David Middleton, they learned that Powell may not have been his only victim. On April 9th, a man was walking his dog outside Bernie, Nevada. He found the skeletonized remains of a human being. They were entangled in knotted ropes and plastic garbage bags. Police brought the remains to the crime lab. Criminalists compared its DNA to a sample from an unsolved missing persons case. They made a positive match. A check of dental records confirmed the victim's ID. She was Thelma de Villa, who worked at one of the larger casinos in the area. She had been missing since August 8, 1994, the exact day Middleton had rented the storage shed. The excessive ropes, knots, and garbage bags found on Devia's remains mirrored those found on Catherine Powell's body. The knots provided information about the victim's final hours. The stresses applied to the knots showed that both women were alive when their hands and feet were bound. And they had struggled desperately against the ropes before they died. We specifically looked at knots from two different murders and compared them to each other, showing that the same types of knots had been used in both these uh, deaths. Devia's DNA was then compared to the DNA traces found in Middleton's shed. The results were ironclad. Like Powell, she had been in the shed. 
but the DNA traces of several other people were also found there. If David Middleton was a serial killer, Powell and DeVia were the only victims ever found. As the case against Middleton was prepared, the grim sequence of events leading to Powell's death became clear. Middleton, working as a cable TV installer, had probably gained access to her home under the pretext of checking her cable service. He then subdued her and took her to his storage shed. There, she was tied up, brutalized, and kept confined in the airless refrigerator. Sometime during this torture, she died. Middleton methodically wrapped her body in plastic garbage bags, sewed it into a sleeping bag, and enshrouded the bundle with yellow plastic bound with rope. Finally, under cover of night, he disposed of the remains in the dumpster. Police were fortunate the body was ever found. But Middleton didn't realize that a brimming dumpster would appeal not only to him, but also to a transient looking for scraps. He had been clever up to a point. The investigation uncovered the fact that Middleton had installed cable service in an apartment near Thelma DeVia's home the week before she disappeared. And on the day of DeVia's disappearance, a neighbor remembered seeing Middleton near her home. On September 15, 1997, the jury convicted David Middleton of two counts of first-degree murder. Without uh, the DNA evidence, uh, without the trace and fiber evidence, without the metal uh, evidence and experts, and more, most importantly, uh, the testimony of our pathologist, uh, we would have had no case. Without the trace evidence, uh, we had nothing. This evidence was so compelling that Middleton was condemned to two sentences of death by lethal injection. Dave Middleton is not your typical killer. All I can say about uh, uh, this guy, as opposed to most of them, is certainly he's police smart and he's street smart. Uh, and when you have that, that's a dangerous combination. Whether murder is committed in an urban jungle or far out in the countryside, some trace of the deed will be left to tell the tale. March 22, 1988. Deep in a forest south of St. Louis, there began one of the most baffling cases ever encountered by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. And try to determine whether it's an Indian grave or it's a fresh grave or it appears it's been here for some time. The case concerned fragments of a human skeleton. Was this an innocent, ancient death, or the victim of some monstrous modern crime? It would take some of the most specialized skills in forensic science to decide. Sergeants Don Bazelli, William Conway, and D.W. Kreitz were among the first on the scene. I received a phone call from the ranger at the Boy Scout camp who advised me that he had discovered some skeletal remains. Uh, I went to the scout camp and he directed me to the graveside. The investigation had its origins four months earlier. Ramo Pitkanen, a surveyor from Finland and former Eagle Scout, had been hired to make a map of the SF Boy Scout Ranch. On November 2nd, 1987, he made an unwelcome discovery. Frightened of becoming involved, Pitkanen told no one what he found until just before his return to Finland. Well, Interpol uh, had the Finnish authorities contact the gentleman in, in Helsinki and conducted an interview with him, which was sent to us in Finnish, uh, after which we had to have translated. For nearly a week, investigators combed the site. Pickings were thin, a skull and lower jaw, 
a few strands of dark hair, and an assortment of bones, some scattered several hundred feet from the grave. Many showed tooth marks, signs they had been chewed by animals. It's a very shallow grave. Uh, the bones uh, doesn't look like we're going to have many bones in it. Um, we're finding on the outer perimeter uh, a couple of bones that may uh, belong to uh, what we've got here. We're going to have to look into it. It's not much to go on right now. But as the investigation continued, clues slowly began to emerge, including a plastic shopping bag. We first thought that they could have been a no, an Indian burial uh, site, but then when we excavated the grave, finding the service merchandise bag and determining that it was probably from 1979 to 1985, finding that down in the grave really helped us. There was another clue, one which would eventually narrow down the identity of the victim, a single metal button. Stamped across its face was a logo, Texwood. The next few weeks were frustrating for Conway and his colleagues. Preliminary investigations suggested the remains came from a young woman, perhaps 25 to 30 years of age, the mother of two or more children. Surely someone had reported her missing. Well, the, the victim was uh, first identified as a Caucasian female, and uh, we started checking uh, missing person reports on Caucasian females, and there were quite a few that fit the, uh, the approximate age and, and uh, size and weight of uh, what we had. In fact, this victim should have been especially easy to identify. She had perfect teeth. The skull and the remaining teeth indicated no dental work and no cavities, uh, which is very rare in our society, and, and we were able to eliminate a number of the suspected missing persons that we were investigating. Soon, the investigators had eliminated all the missing persons from Missouri and from a half dozen surrounding states. The skeleton in the woods was not a missing person. Or rather, no one had reported this young woman as missing. The investigators decided to try another approach. They contacted forensic anthropologist Michael Charney at Colorado State University. He had a remarkable talent for identifying individuals from the most fragmentary skeletons. With near miraculous skill, he could often reconstruct the age, sex, and race, even the facial appearance of a missing person. I said, wait a minute. The first thing that hit me is that this was not a white person. This, is, this was Oriental. This was somebody of Mongoloid extraction, American Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Eskimo, something of that nature. Charney had picked up on something the police investigators missed. White people and black people have relatively long, narrow faces. People of Mongolian and Asian heritage have much broader faces. Meanwhile, police investigators were making progress of their own with other physical evidence from the grave. Their attention centered on that button with the curious Texwood logo. We thought when we found the button, it would be an easy thing to identify. Uh, the word Texwood being on the button, we called Texas, uh, trying to find someone down there that might know it. We found all kinds of manufacturers with the name Tex and Tex Wood uh, in Texas, but nothing would match. Finally, we called uh, U.S. Customs uh, within a couple hours. I uh, got a call back uh, to contact an agent in New York who put me in touch with a representative of Tex Wood. Who they manufacture the jeans, the blue jeans, uh, in Hong Kong and they're called uh, the Levi of the Orient. Texwood sold jeans exclusively in the Far East, slender cuts specifically designed for Asian figures. The police's portrait of the victim was growing clearer. More important, it matched the picture given by Michael Charney, a slim woman, Asian, in her mid or late 20s, a mother of two or more children. The likelihood of the victim being from Asia dramatically narrowed the field of possible victims. 
but who was she? One of the many leads police pursued involved a missing person in Georgia, an Asian female. Officers investigating the case obtained a photo of the woman, which they sent to Charney. Michael Charney's approach was simple in theory, but tricky in practice. Take a photograph of the skull and superimpose it over the image of the possible victim. The fit must be exact if an identification is to be made. Would Charney and his colleague Nita Bittner be able to match the police photographs to the skull found in the woods at the Boy Scout camp? In this case, when we got the eyes and the nose in close proximity, the nose still doesn't match, it's too broad, the cheek depth is too far apart or not far enough on one side, the teeth are a mismatch, and the chin is still out of place. After trying and refocusing for size and other distortions, we were still unable to come up with a match. By now, every attempt to identify the victim had failed. Charney had one last suggestion, recreate the woman's face. The reconstruction of a face from a skull is among the most specialized and most spectacular skills in a forensic anthropologist's arsenal. It begins with mathematical precision. A collection of round rubber pegs of varying lengths glued to a plaster cast of the skull. The pegs are landmarks, each identifying the thickness of soft tissue at particular points on the face. Next, the pegs are connected with strips of modeling clay. Bit by bit, humanity returns. Plastic eyes are placed in the sockets, and the skull comes to life. Careful modeling, perhaps dabbing with a damp sponge, gives the texture of skin. Paint, a black wig, will complete the transformation. For the first time, we can glimpse the victim face to face. In doing a facial reconstruction, um, it's not as important that it's absolutely accurate, but that it gives a glimpse of who the person was to somebody out there who will hopefully recognize it. When we do our facial reconstructions, it's generally a last ditch attempt. Now, would anyone recognize the face rebuilt by Michael Charney's team? August 24th, a photograph of the reconstructed face appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Three days later, two informants claimed that the photo looked like their friend, Bunchi Nyhaus. A mother of two, she was a native of Thailand. They had not seen her since late 1983. Bunchi had a husband, Richard Nyhaus, an ex-GI whom she had met in Bangkok during the Vietnam War. When we first talked to Mr. Niehaus, he appeared to be uh, an upstanding citizen. He, uh, he maintained a, a nice house by himself, uh, clean, very, you know, upstanding citizen in a nice neighborhood. He was uh, employed, gainfully employed, full time. He was raising two sons on his own. Uh, they attended church, were very good students. Nyhaus had a ready explanation for his wife's absence. In December 1983, he and Bun Chi had a series of bitter arguments. She had insisted on leaving him and their two sons and returning to Bangkok. It was a story the officers didn't entirely believe. The way to resolve the matter was to eliminate Bun Chi as the victim in the forest grave. He was very cooperative. He provided me photos out of their photo album uh, of his uh, wife that we could use if we needed to in the investigation. The photograph was not ideal, but Michael Charney did his best. Like any photograph at an angle would be, you have to get it in the same two planes exactly, you see. Despite the difficulties of matching the position of face and skull, in the end, Michael Charney had no doubt that this was Bun Chi. We first received word from our lab that Dr. Charney had matched uh, 
the photographs of Bunchy Nyehouse to the remains that, that we had recovered. And at that time, the case took on a whole new outlook. We now knew who our victim was, and we also had a good uh, suspect to start with in, in Mr. Niehaus. The investigators quickly uncovered a series of incriminating facts. Richard Nyehaus and his wife frequently had noisy arguments. He had taken several days off work in December 1983, the same time his wife disappeared. Soon after she vanished, Nyehaus divorced Bun Chi and removed her as a beneficiary of his insurance. And then one final damning discovery. We ultimately discovered that he was a Boy Scout leader, which then tied right into the fact that her remains were found in a Boy Scout camp. He had been actively involved with Boy Scouts with his children for many years. By now, Richard Nyehouse was the primary suspect. The investigators decided to invite him in for further questioning. They chose their moment with care, a weekend when Nyehouse was camping at the SF Ranch, not far from where his wife's body had been hidden. The officers informed Nyehaus the remains they had recovered had been identified as those of his wife. Nyehaus admitted he had pushed his wife, who had fallen and hurt her head. When she threatened to call the police, to leave him, taking the children with her, he bent down, put his hand over her nose and mouth, and held it there until she was dead. Then he hid her body in the freezer. The reason that we weren't getting any hits out of the uh, computer files is that the victim's husband didn't ne never reported her missing. He said that he took her to the airport and she went back to Thailand, but in fact he murdered her. Kept her in his house in the freezer for three months and then took her down to the Boy Scout ranch and buried her. Richard Nyehaus was convicted of first-degree murder. He is now serving a life sentence without parole. Time and the elements had taken their toll on Bun Chi's body, adding to the difficulty of finding her killer. But even just a few hours can make the difference between solving a case and losing the trail forever. In September 1983, Two friends near Jacksonville, Florida, were shocked to find the body of a man. He lay on his side at the foot of a sand dune. His head showed severe wounds. Investigators from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office quickly responded. They found no identification on the body. The only clues were a broken pool cue and footprints leading to some tire tracks in the sand. Police worked carefully to gather and protect all the evidence. The tire tracks seemed like the most promising clue to lead to the killer. They were lucky to have it. Rain, the slightest breeze, or one false step could destroy the fragile traces. Preserving the tire tracks required particular expertise. The very act of making a cast could destroy them. Police called the Jacksonville Regional Crime Laboratory and forensic criminalist Ernest Ham. So the crime scene was processed with these tracks in mind. Uh, the footwear tracks and the tire tracks were photographed. Then we want to make a plaster cast because a plaster cast will give us a true representation, a three-dimensional representation of the object that made it. Care in the pouring was crucial in order to prevent the weight of the plaster from destroying the print. If the evidence were altered, a killer might go free. After the plaster had set, the cast was carefully cleaned. Now, police had a perfect three-dimensional reproduction of the tire trail. 
It included the gouges and signs of wear that made that tire unique. But millions of tires roll on America's highways today. It seemed impossible for investigators to find the one tire that had made these tracks. They studied the plaster cast, noting the ribs and grooves of the tread design. Despite the odds of finding the tire, it offered investigators their best chance to catch the killer. Matching the track with a tire on a suspect's car would be as conclusive in court as a fingerprint. Ham searched through thousands of photographs in the pages of the Tread Design Guide to find the one tire he needed. As Ham searched for a clue to the killer, another jogger found a clue to the victim. The wallet belonged to a 21-year-old sailor serving on a ship docked at the Mayport Naval Air Station in Jacksonville. An officer from the ship was called to the morgue. He confirmed that the victim was Jeffrey Michael Russell. An autopsy was performed on the victim's remains. He had been beaten, probably with the pool cue found at the scene. It bore no usable fingerprints. He had then been shot once in the head from less than two feet away. The pathologist recovered a 357 caliber bullet from the victim's brain. Russell's shipmate said he was well liked and had been out with friends on the night he died. Thanks for coming, guys. Police speculated that the victim might have even shared a round of drinks with his killers. He was last seen leaving a party, planning to hitchhike back to base. While the police traced the victim's movements, Ham continued his arduous, time-intensive search of the tread guide. Finally, after reviewing thousands of images, he found the single tire that matched the cast. The track at the beach was made by a tire commonly mounted on pickup trucks. Now, police knew what they were looking for, though it hardly seemed to advance their investigation. To find one truck out of thousands in the Jacksonville area would be daunting. But then police got a lucky break that saved them hundreds of hours. An officer, answering a call about a robbery, pulled over a suspicious truck. The driver tried to run off, but was soon apprehended and arrested. His name was Gregory Kokel. Police inspected his truck. They found a gun under the seat. Kokel was known to police. He was a suspect in a murder case several years before, though never charged. But his name had come up even more recently. Police had just received an anonymous tip that Kokel had bragged of robbing and killing a man on the beach. The gun retrieved from the truck, a 357 revolver, was the same caliber used to kill Russell. The officer then noticed that the tires seemed to resemble the ones involved in Russell's murder. Until now, solving the case had seemed like a long shot. Now, police had the prime suspect and possibly all the evidence to convict him. To make the charges stick, they'd have to link him to the scene of the crime. Police looked to the tires to make that connection. An officer compared Kokel's right front truck tire to a photograph from the tread guide. The way he described it was that the hair stood up on the back of his neck that he was really seeing what we told him he was going to see. 
the tire was the brand and model they were looking for. But police were not certain it was the same tire that left its mark at the beach. Ham's work wasn't done. He still had to find the exact section of the tire's tread that had made the print. He scrutinized every inch of the tread, looking for cuts, gouges, and wear that matched the portion captured in plaster. These are the marks and gouges that are put into a tire as you drive it. These will leave what we need for making a positive identification. This makes this tire unique. But every mile driven since the night of the murder put new wear marks on the tire and altered the old ones. Even if Ham had the exact tire in his lab, it might be too late to make the perfect match. A killer could still go free. Jacksonville police were building a murder case on a foundation of sand. Now they needed harder evidence. After careful analysis, investigators found marks in Gregory Kokel's tire that matched the casting made at the crime scene. But police needed to prove that Kokel himself was there. They hoped Kokel's 357 would provide the smoking gun they needed. If this was the exact gun that fired the fatal bullet, investigators had to prove that Kokel pulled the trigger. Ham performed three tests designed to link the gun with the crime. Our first examination will be a visual examination because we want to see if there's any other sort of trace matter on the weapon before we subject it to some sort of processing techniques, such as, uh, in this case, because it's a head wound, if it was a close head wound, we could possibly have tissue blowback into the weapons. But this test was a dead end. No tissue or blood was found on the gun. The next step was to test it for fingerprints. The gun was sealed in a glass cabinet and exposed to fumes of cyanoacrylate ester, or common superglue. These fumes adhere to fingerprints, making them easier to see and compare. But based upon the individual characteristics of the ridges, the endings and the divisions and the dots, we can make a positive identification from any part of the body that bears friction skin. The fumes did their work in just a few minutes. The print on the gun was compared to Kokel's prints at his arrest. They were a perfect match. This one fingerprint only proved that Kokel had held the gun. It did not prove that this gun had fired the fatal bullet. That could only be determined by a ballistics test. The test fired bullet was placed side by side on a microscope for comparison with the bullet that killed the victim. The investigator lines up the rifling patterns on both bullets. A video monitor allows him to see the minute scratches on the soft lead. If the marks align, he has proof that the same gun fired both bullets. And that's precisely what he saw. The scratch marks on both slugs were identical. Investigators had found the murder weapon. As the prosecution prepared for trial, the events of Russell's final night came into focus. As he hitchhiked back to the base, he was picked up by Gregory Kokel and a friend. Come on, come on 
But instead of dropping Russell at his quarters, they drove him to the beach, beat him, robbed him of the only dollar he had, and then Kokel shot him. Crimes committed by strangers on strangers are the hardest to solve. But the scratches on the bullet, the fingerprint, and the tire tread bore the traces of the killer's guilt. Close forensic analysis pulled them together to make a solid case against Kokel. The weapon was the weapon that fired the fatal shot. The fingerprint belonged to the individual that was suspected of committing the crime. The senseless, random nature of the murder assured that Gregory Kokel and his accomplice would receive stiff sentences. Forensics proved beyond a doubt that Kokel fired the fatal bullet. He was sentenced to death. His friend was deemed an accessory to murder and received 14 years. For years, only the most obvious evidence could be used to solve a murder. Today, scrupulous collection methods by police and rigorous evidence processing by forensics experts are helping to assure that nothing gets overlooked.